Good afternoon. All right, I would like to start my talk off by some audience participation. And if there is some house lights, is there any house lights? Oh, there they are, look. Oh, whoa, well, comes. there's a few people in the house. Um, can, I, can I please ask you, I'm going to ask some questions. And if you agree with what I'm saying, I just want you to put your hands up if possible. Who enjoys solving challenging problems? Wow. Who likes being creative? Well, yeah. Anybody like working in a team? Wow. <laughs> do you want to do something that makes a difference? Yes. And well, most importantly, I suppose, do you want a career? Have you got a career that you enjoy doing? All right, OK. <laughs> Okay, I'll take that one, all right? But generally, thank you very much for that. Generally, STEM, if you answered positively to any of those questions, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, could be relevant to you. I like to think so, because that's what I do now. I go around and inspire the next generation into careers like I've had over the last, I dare to, to think, about 35 years. And, you know, there has been some great STEM events in the not too distant past. Who saw Felix jump from nearly space, 24 miles up, 833 miles an hour in free fall, faster than the speed of sound? Did you see that when it happened? Wasn't it fantastic? Edge of, really edge of the seat stuff. You know, as he just before he came out of the capsule here, is he going to do it? Is he not? And I'll tell you, as engineers, we're a pretty inquisitive bunch. I've always wondered what that little red button there is all about. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's what we call an emergency stop. Is he going to bottle out and hit that button? And then does a big ladder come out or something? I don't know. We will never know. But look, just like Felix jumped from space, we're going to be a, a jump from space, and you saw that live. We're going to stream everything we do live on the internet when we run our great car. We think we're going to be sort of exposed in 230 countries, reaching a TV audience about 1.5 billion. We're going to stream 500 data channels, two video channels for each run of our car, and we're expecting in excess of 20 million followers for every run of the car, compounded run on run. 30 runs in 2017, 18, and more to follow, leaving at least, we hope, a 20-year legacy. So there it is. There's our car. It's dark blue, it's orange, and it's pretty shiny. Okay, and it's got all sorts of names on it, as you can read. Some of the more conspicuous ones, Castrol, Rolls-Royce, Jaguar Land Rover, Geely, Rolex, just to name a few. But those, those companies, Scientific, engineering, technical companies, do you know what? They don't have the scientists, technicians, engineers, mathematicians, girls, boys looking forward even for a year or so. So that's why they're with us on our journey. That's the hook, because of this inspirational message that we're giving, and we're trying to inspire the next generation. Because let's face it, look, with our dark blue and orange shiny car, if we can't inspire some kids to take that road, that door there, we might as well lock and all go home. We, the UK PLC has an, a major issue in terms of we're 20,000 graduates short going into STEM-based learning. And only 9% of the ones that actually are going in that direction are female. Hashtag 9% is not enough. That issue we need to make, you know, attention to and to try and address another quest of ours. Now let me just wind the clock back a few years. Our project director, Richard Noble. Richard, ever since he was a youngster, set his heart on getting a world land speed record and bringing the world land speed record back to Great Britain. At that particular time, we used to lend it to the Americans and then we won it back again. We've had it for a little while now, but uh, uh, in 1983, Richard with that car, driving that car at 633 miles an hour, realized his dream. He got the world land speed record back to Great Britain, and it has been on these shores ever since. Aerodynamics of a house brick, by today's standards, possibly. 
And we've also learned that if that car had gone seven miles an hour faster than 633, i.e. 640 miles an hour, it would have become airborne. The story today would have probably been somewhat different. But look, Richard's not a guy who's going to stand still, rest on his laurels, because 633 miles an hour is pretty close to something else. So he goes back to his great engineers, technicians, scientists, mathematicians, all those great people, and says, hey, I want to commission another car. And this time, I'm going to call the car Thrust SSC. SSC, anybody? Do you know what that stands for? What was that over there? Super slippery car, sir? <laughs> Super speedy car, sir? Could be both of those. Supersonic car, it actually is. Supersonic, what does that mean? It means it's going to go faster than the noise that it makes. And here is the car running at those speeds. At that time, squadron leader Andy Green of the RAF, he drove that car at just over 763 miles an hour back in October 1997, 20 years ago this year. And nobody has come anywhere close to that. So another tick in the box. We've raised the land speed record. We've now got a car going faster than the speed of sound. So why do we want to go faster than that? Should we go faster than that? I often say to the kids in the school, should we go faster than that? Yeah, let's go faster than that. Why? Oh, sorry, that sounds like my telephone. Just hang on a moment. <laughs> Hello. Uh, no, I haven't been involved in an accident, and I don't want any of that PPI either. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, that wasn't a real call, but look, that... <laughs> that was my phone, believe it or not, back in the day. And I normally say to the kids, how cool was I walking down the street with that in my top pocket? Standby battery time of that, of that phone, if you were lucky, was 20 minutes. <laughs> then you need a big sack of batteries to power it. It could do two things. I say to the youngsters, you know what it could do? Uh, they can make a call. Yes, they get that one. They normally say, text her, text her. They can't text. It's even before that. Oh, well, it can make a call and receive a call. <laughs> and I've since that found, it does a third thing. Do you know what it does? keeps the door open because <laughs> that is a brick but that was the technology back then in fact Jason Bradbury there of the gadget show they voted that phone or that model of phone as the number one gadget of all time it was the game changer the technology exists today we've all got smartphones and what they can't do isn't even worth talking about so technology's moved on we can do things differently We've also got challenges, people trying to get to this holy grail of 1,000 miles an hour out there. This is the old Craig Breedlove car, Spirit of America. Steve Fawcett's name's on the side of that car. Steve Fawcett bought that car and was going after the world land speed record. That's the car in 2006 that got Andy Green and Richard Noble back round a table considering are we going to put a challenge together. Consequently, we're here and around today. We're doing that. The Americans are still there. There it is, that's North American Eagle. The Australians are around. Roscoe McGlashan in Western Australia, car called Aussie Invader 5R. So, you know, like anything else, it's the first person that does this are the ones that get remembered. Andy Green's email address is worldsfastestman.com. He doesn't want to be worldsecondfastestman.com, so we have to keep him up there. So, we want a 1,000 miles an hour car. How are we going to do that? How are we going to build one? Well, we've got the benefits of some really large computers, clusters of computers, a science called CFD, Computational Fluid Dynamics, Swansea University helping us uh, a lot in this way. And they, the computers on CFD give us nice, pretty pictures like that. And I often say to students, do you know what those colors mean? Because they do mean something. A lot of people say, well, they're thermal images, aren't they? So they look like one, but in this case, they're not. The red areas are areas of high pressure, drag. That's what's going to slow the car down. We don't want too many areas of high pressure or of drag. We need a few. We want a few, a little bit on the nose to keep the car under control. 
because those computers have come up with that design. That design has taken them about five years to come up with. All right, and that car is aerodynamically neutral between zero and 1,000 miles an hour. That means it won't go up and it won't go down. If a person had done that work the old way, it would have took, taken one person over 50 years to have come up with the design of that, that car. So we can use the technology. We need a lot of power in that car. There's our workhorse engine, kindly loaned to us by one of our great sponsors, Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce have lent us three of these engines to play with. Okay, normally resides in the back of a Eurofighter Typhoon uh, military jet. 20,000 pounds of thrust that, that engine gives us. It's got a power to weight ratio nine to one. It weighs a ton, it gives us nine tons of thrust in return. Game changer of an engine. We use it in what we call for the techies here, wet configuration. That means um, it's uh, using reheat, or as the Americans would call it, afterburner. But that's not enough. That'll take us to about 600-ish miles an hour. We then got to use one of these. We've got to use a rocket. So we have the jet and we have a rocket on the bottom. The last 17 seconds of the run, approximately, Andy will light the rocket. That rocket then will take the car through to 1,000 miles an hour. It's what's called a hybrid rocket. All right, it uses two fuels. It uses a solid core fuel in the rocket, and we pump in a liquid oxidizer. And we pump 1,000 liters of liquid oxidizer in 17 seconds. 26,000 pounds of thrust. Total thrust for the car, 46,000 pounds of thrust. What does that mean? Do you know what? 135,000 horsepower. Whew. Huge numbers. Let me put that into some more perspective. I used to work a few years ago for a shipping company called Cunard. I was an engineering officer with Cunard. And we had a ship with us then on the fleet called the QE2. One of you, or two of you may remember that ship. That ship, total power, ca carrying 3,000 people on world cruises and the like, was 110,000 horsepower. Put 25,000 horsepower more into the QE2 cruise liner, or equivalent today, and there you have the power of our car, carrying one man 12 miles. Phenomenal. There it is, the world's fastest car. Here's some more statistics. Hold on to your hats. Here we go. Nought to 1,000 miles an hour in 55 seconds. One mile in 3.6 seconds. Not one, two, three, or four, but four and a half football pitches in one second. Can you blink for me, sir? Yes, thank you very much. You blinked. If you, if you were in Wembley Football Stadium on the halfway line and did that, and the car was coming from right to left, blink and you will miss it. <laughs> and just to round it off, it's faster than a bullet from a gun. Phenomenal statistics. And can you imagine the effect that that has when we go into schools and colleges and the like with the youngsters? We actually race with the youngsters, these little model rocket cars, about that long, at silly speeds, 70 miles an hour across a playground. My colleagues and friends say to me, what were you doing yesterday? I was racing model rocket cars at 70 miles an hour across the playground. What, you do that for a living? Fantastic. They design them, they build them, they craft them, we race them, we measure acceleration, we measure speed. They have a wonderful day. But it's really important that we bring the message back to the classroom. Quite, quite often, once they've had a great day, we get back and get back into a group I put that picture up, I say to them, do you know who that is? They all know who that is, that's Isaac Newton. And I ask them, well, what's he got to do with what, do what we've just done? And the best way of anything like that is to demonstrate it. I will say to them, here is a combustion chamber. Combustion, that means we're going to burn something. Oh, can we burn something? Oh, let's burn something. <laughs> and and we might even have an explosion. Oh, yes, let's have, one, have an explosion as well. So there's a combustion chamber, an empty tube. Now I say to them, is there any oxygen in there? Can you see it? Is there oxygen in there, sir? Can you see it? You can't see it, but there's, actually it's getting quite thin in here at the moment. But there is some oxygen in there. 
And then I say, okay, we've got some oxygen. I need two other things to make that burn. Make some, what, do, what else do I need? I need some fuel, and I need an, an ignition source. And as I have happen to have here, we have some jet fuel, which we bring in especially from America. So if I put some jet fuel in this tube, nice bit of jet fuel, there we go. And I put the top on nicely. We've got a nice fuel air mixture in there. And this might do well for a, yes, there we go. Now, if you were a group of kids in primary, can we do it again? Can we do it again? You know, I won't do it again. But I say to them, look, the learning, <laughs> the, the learning there, what happened in that tube? Well, the gases expanded, didn't they? Do you know what? That's what happens in your parents' car's engines. The gases expand in the fuel and drives the pistons. That's the, the process of what happens in a jet engine. You know, in the combustion section of a jet engine, those gases expand and then they turn some more turbine blades. But then I bring it back to us and I say, look, if I was hanging that tube with a piece of string and I did that experiment, what would that tube do? They say, well, it would go in that way, that direction, say, wouldn't it? I said, yes, it would. Why does it do that? Because that's what Mr. Newton said. That's what Mr. Newton said about his third law for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And then what I say to them, I say, look, if you don't leave here with any other thought today, that your cars went down that playground at a silly speed, 70 miles an hour. They went down there because of what Mr. Newton said, Newton's third law. Our car is going to go down a desert at 1,000 miles an hour plus because of what Mr. Newton said. Do you all see the penny drop? And they get it. Learning by doing is extremely powerful, and that's what we're all about. Simple dynamics in education. Inspiration leads to aspiration, leads to enhanced education. We're going to take our car here later this year. This is Nuki Aero Hub in the southwest of the UK, and we're going to run the car up to 200, 250 miles an hour. Now, you've got to be mindful that our car is a bespoke collection of three and a half thousand unique parts, all working in harmony to, as we expect them to work. As an engineer, and as everybody probably expects, that won't happen first time, we know that. And when we're happy that all those three and a half thousand parts are all working exactly as we want them to, we'll put the car into one of these. There we are at RAF Fairford last year, and uh, we had a trial fit of the car into that aeroplane. And we'll take it to South Africa, and we'll run the car up to 800 miles an hour first-ish, and then we'll re-engineer the car and go back for 1,000 miles an hour. Here's a little message for now Wing Commander Andy Green. I'm the fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force, and I'm the driver for the Bloodhound supersonic car. The key global partnership of engineering expertise is going to do something remarkable that the racing community is going to remember forever. It's human nature to want to push the boundaries, to want to explore what's possible, to go to the moon, to stand there. Only 12 people ever got to stand on the moon. Generations were inspired by the achievement of doing that. And Project Bloodhound is about the Apollo shot for the 21st century, taking the record to the absolute limit of modern technology, literally pushing back the boundaries of physics. As Andy there said, the Apollo program was, a, was an inspiration to a generation. It inspired thousands. I'm probably living proof of that. My formative years in the 70s is when the Apollo program was in full flight. There's some statistics of uptake of physics PhDs. It's American statistics. In that red shaded area is at the time of the Apollo program. And you can see the spike in the graph there. That is what we want to emulate with our great engineering program. We do have a direct link back to Apollo. 
There is the late, great Neil Armstrong with Andy with the car. He was an avid follower of our project, communicated with the team and even visited us in Bristol. And I had the pleasure late last year in New Scientist Live exhibition where we are with the car, this guy walked onto the stand. He was visiting the UK, he was part of the SPRACE program at that particular time promoting their activities. That is Colonel Al Warden, Apollo 15, Command Module Pilot. That absolutely <laughs> made my year. Ladies and gentlemen, Bloodhound SSC, Engineering Adventure, the future generation's Apollo moment. We got it. Everything is going to be wonderful. Thank you.